This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, Keeping Our Sights on Mars, a review of NASA's deep space exploration programs and lunar proposal. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here and, uh, and thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, so today we're examining NASA's deep space exploration programs, the capabilities and plans that will enable Americans to go beyond our low Earth orbit neighborhood and into deep space. Successive NASA, acts, uh, NASA authorization acts have authorized a stepping stone approach to human exploration, with the most recent the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017, establishing Mars as the long-term goal. The law also directed NASA to prepare a human exploration roadmap. In hearings from the last Congress to the present, members of the subcommittee and full committee have repeatedly asked for this roadmap, only to receive a response, in response, a high-level strategy that was delivered over a year and a half late. I refer to this roadmap because, as the authorizing committee, it is our responsibility to the American taxpayers to ensure that human space exploration plans and budget requests are based on sound analyses and clear goals and objectives. We support NASA and we want it to succeed. So I am concerned that as we prepare to reauthorize NASA again, we have many unanswered questions about the future of our nation's human space exploration program. How and when will we get to Mars? What technologies and systems are needed to get us there? What are the interim destinations and precursor missions that scientists and engineers have determined to be the most effective means to get us there? What is the future of the International Space Station, and what are the priorities to enable an eventual Mars mission? How long should it be operated, and what, follow, and what will follow in low Earth orbit? Mars is, on the, Mars is the horizon goal, and I want Americans to be the first to set foot on the red planet. But make no mistake about it, there's an elephant in the room, and it's the moon. In the absence of an integrated roadmap, the administration decided that the moon is the place to go with humans, that we should go there sustainably, and, that, and be there permanently, though not necessarily with humans. And as of just six weeks ago, the vice president said that we need to get there fast, in five years rather than nine years. While I can't argue with the desire to invigorate our human exploration efforts and find near-term milestones to demonstrate success, the lack of planning evidence so far is no way to run our nation's human space exploration program. The 2024 missive left NASA in a tizzy, scrambling to develop a plan and hastening to pull together a budget amendment that still has not been delivered to Congress and upending groundwork with international partners on future exploration goals. What are the primary goals and objectives for going to the moon? Are they geopolitical, scientific, commercial, or as risk, re risk reduction efforts for an eventual Mars mission? On which goal is NASA basing its architecture and mission decisions? Simply saying yes to all of them is not an adequate way to determine our priorities. And how will we get there by 2024? NASA's solution? Get the private sector to do it and do it fast. Whether or not that will be through cost plus or firm fixed price contracts, which are not typically used for development projects, whether or not contracts would involve a cost sharing, and at what level NASA oversight would be uh, involved have not been made clear. While public-private partnerships have a role to play, their use in human spaceflight programs has not yet been demonstrated. Commercial crew providers were awarded contracts in 2014 with an initial path plan for certification by 2017. It's 2019, and while they're making good progress, we're still hitchhiking uh, rides with the Russians to low Earth orbit. Not only that, under those contracts, it's the companies, not NASA, that decide what information the public should be entitled to should something go wrong. We all know that space flight is risky and things do go wrong. So let me be clear, 
I absolutely support America's robust, growing, and innovative space industry. A United States human space exploration program that leads the world should be leveraging private sector innovation. The question is how? At present, we have a White House directive to land humans on the moon in five years, but no plan and no budget details on how to do so, and no integrated human space exploration roadmap laying out how we can best achieve the horizon goal, Mars. In essence, we're flying blind. I'll close with this thought. I believe all of us, Republicans and Democrats alike, share the goal of a successful and ambitious human space exploration program that enables the United States, in concert with its international partners, to explore destinations in deep space, such as the Moon and Mars. Such ambitious civil space goals are not only inspiring, but essential to enabling discovery, providing benefits to society, and sustaining U.S. leadership in the peaceful uses of outer space. The Space Exploration Initiative of 1989 and the 2004 Vision for Space Exploration were unfulfilled attempts to achieving deep space exploration goals to go to the moon and Mars. Will our efforts this time be an opportunity lost or an opportunity gained? If they are to be an opportunity gained, we will need an integrated and stable plan adequate and sustained resources, and a commitment that transcends political party and election timelines to get us there. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ranking Member Babin for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. We appreciate it. I want to say thank you to all you witnesses that are here today. We're looking forward to hearing your testimonies. Uh, <clears throat> as this is the first formal hearing of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee of the 116th Congress, I'd like to formally welcome you to the committee, and I look forward to working with you, Chairman Horn, uh, on one of the most exciting issues that we deal with here in Congress, and that is space exploration. This is not only one of the most exciting issues, but it is also one of the most exciting times for space exploration. We have a renewed sense of urgency and purpose that is coupled with focus, leadership, and enthusiasm. I'm ex <clears throat> excited to be involved in our nation's space enterprise at this moment in our history. We have a unique opportunity before us. We have an administration that put forth a bold direction, and we have an agency that stands ready to meet that challenge. We've seen proposals to reinvigorate NASA. Uh, before, but we are uniquely positioned at this moment to capitalize on the investments made over the last two decades. Unlike President Kennedy's challenge to put a man on the moon within the decade, we have already made the investments in the systems that will turn that challenge into a reality. And we now have robust centers and infrastructure, an eager workforce, a modern industrial base, a hungry commercial sector, a vibrant space market, and years of hardware development already under our belts. We are in the final stages of developing the space launch system. We've already conducted a flight test, excuse me, a test flight of the Orion capsule and ground systems at the Kennedy Space Center are being built as we speak. The President has provided direction, focus, and enthusiasm which will only help us in making uh, continued progress. And that isn't to say that we don't have work to do. Specifically, we need a clear plan and a realistic budget proposal. We need to be cautious about developing a plan that is overly ambitious or too costly. And we need to ensure that OMB sufficiently funds the plan and subsequent budget requests. We must develop next generation spacesuits and human class landers, scale up in space propulsion and life support systems and properly mitigate radiation hazards. We must also develop these capabilities in an extensible manner that enables an, an evolvable architecture that can explore not only the moon, but also Mars and beyond. And as the National Academy's Pathways to Exploration Report recommended, NASA should develop technologies that feed forward from one mission to the next and reduce or eliminate the development of dead-end technologies. 
Furthermore, Space Policy Directive 1 directed NASA to lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and to bring back to Earth new knowledge and new opportunities. Developing a plan that takes into account both the principles of extensibility and sustainability will be very challenging and will require NASA to make difficult decisions going forward. But I believe that NASA is well up to this task. We must also be mindful of artificial schedule pressures. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel has noted in several reports that it's important to set challenging but achievable uh, schedules and not allow undue schedule pressure to lead to decisions that adversely impact safety and mission assurance. Maintaining a balance between setting challenging yet achievable goals and taking prudent steps to ensure safe operations will certainly need to be addressed in any future plans. Humanity will, content, or will co excuse me, humanity will commit to the task of exploring the cosmos. The only real question is whether the United States will be the one to lead in that effort. I, for one, will do everything that I can to ensure that this happens. Before I yield back my time, I would like to make one final observation. The administration is still finalizing their lunar plans. And while this hearing is very helpful, and I realize that NASA previously committed to delivering a plan to the committee by now, holding the hearing without new details does seem premature. I would respectfully recommend that we hear from NASA once this plan is finalized. And so with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Babin, I appreciate that. And uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Chairwoman Johnson for her opening statement. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I want to join the chairwoman and ranking member in welcoming our witnesses to today's hearing, and I look forward to your testimony. I'll be try to be brief in my remarks. It is now more than six weeks since Vice President Pence announced that NASA was being directed by the president to undertake a crash program to land astronauts on the moon within the next five years. Over that six weeks period, the president has been uncharacteristically silent, making no public statements or tweets in support of his lunar initiative. NASA, for its part, has provided no specifics on either plan or the required budget for the proposed accelerated moon. Uh, moon. <laughs> well, this must be a sheet. I hope that when NASA delivers that plan and its revised budget to Congress, it will also provide a compelling rationale for the proposed crash program that justifies the additional resources that will be required to meet the president's arbitrary deadline. Because as chair of the science committee, I cannot look at NASA's proposal in isolation, nor can my colleagues on the appropriations committee. I just came from a hearing on the National Science Foundation's um, fiscal year 2020 budget, where we heard that the president's request would cut NSF's budget by a billion dollars. As you know, NSF is one of the nation's premier research agencies funding research across a range of important scientific disciplines. That billion dollar cut will have serious negative impacts on major research areas if enacted. A week ago, we had a hearing on the NOAA budget request and the news was similar. The president's request would cut NOAA's budget by a billion dollars. And three weeks before that, we heard that the president's request would cut the discretionary budget of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology by more than 30%, or almost $300 million. Finally, the Department of Energy's research programs will be cut by $4.5 billion. So if Congress is to increase NASA's budget, simply to speed up a lunar landing relative to what was already planned, Congress will have to weigh the opportunity cost of doing so. That said, I want to make it clear that I do not support the alternative of cannibalizing NASA's other important research activities 
just to speed up the Human Lunar Exploration Program. On Monday, Ranking Member Lucas and I visited NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and heard about all the important space and earth science research activities being undertaken there. We should be investing more in such inspiring and consequential research rather than cutting it as is proposed in NASA's 2020 request. As I close, I want to reiterate my support for a strong, forward-leaning human and robotic exploration program. I believe that human missions to the moon and Mars, as well as robotic exploration, will continue to inspire as it did when Americans first walked on the moon. But we need to get it right as we pursue such a, a program, and we need to strike the right balance across all of our important national research priorities. Thus, I expect that this committee will need to have NASA appear before us again once it provides us with the information it has promised. And with that, I again want to welcome our witnesses, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the chair now recognizes a ranking member and fellow Oklahoman, uh, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Chair and fellow Oki. Two days ago, I toured the Goddard Space Flight Center with Chairwoman Johnson and Administrator Bridenstein and Director Scalise. The enthusiasm and focus of the NASA family is contagious. And as I said at our last hearing, our nation's space program is a source of pride. It exemplifies the greatest aspects of our country, the pursuit of knowledge, heroism, technical excellence, perseverance, and the intrepid spirit to chart a course into the unknown. Exploration is in our DNA, and no other nation embraces that gift more than the United States. NASA and this administration are harnessing that gift and focusing our efforts to pioneer space. By continuing the investments made over the last two decades, we are progressing towards our national goal to send Americans to the moon, Mars, and beyond. The Vice President challenged the nation to return astronauts to the moon by 2024. It's an exciting and ambitious goal that will ultimately establish a long-term presence on the moon, allowing us to explore its resources, conduct pioneering scientific research. I look forward to reviewing a proposal to achieve that goal. NASA, the administration, Congress, the private sector, and ultimately the American people will all have a role to play in making that happen. As we move forward, we would all benefit from remembering the lessons of previous proposals. The transition from Apollo to shuttle, space station freedom, the proposal to cancel the International Space Station program, the Space Exploration Initiative, the vision of space exploration, the Constellation cancellation, and the Asteroid Retrieval Mission all provide unique lessons. We should also realize that we can no longer take Americans' preeminence in space for granted. Other nations are also uh, have exploration plans. Urgency is now required to maintain our leadership. NASA must provide a detailed plan for this next phase of exploration. The administration and OMB must provide a realistic funding proposal, and Congress must approve and appropriate, appropriately fund the plan. This is not impossible, but it will require tough decisions, and as Americans, we are up to that challenge. And since this is our first hearing of this subcommittee, uh, Chair, I think there's a video that staff has that really kind of sum summarizes all of this. I'd like to ask that the staff play a brief video in my remaining time. Ignition sequence start. All engines up. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this decade is out. We have achieved the earth-shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking, and left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. 
we will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of the giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Sometimes we need to remember where we came from and where we are to be able to go forward. Yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lucas. Uh, I, that was that was inspirational. I think it's I think it's clear uh, that this committee there's a lot of agreement on on both sides that we are fully in support, but we have some unanswered questions, and so I want to again thank the witnesses for being here today. And at this time, I'm going to begin uh, with introduction and allow you all your opening statements. Uh, our first witness today is Mr. Uh, William Gerstenmeyer, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, uh, Mission Directorate at NASA. Mr. Gerstenmeyer provides strategic direction for all aspects of NASA's human exploration of space and cross-agency space support functions of the space communications uh, and space launch vehicles. Prior to his current position, Mr. Gerstenmeyer served as the manager for the International Space Station Program. He also served as the Associate Administrator for Space Operations Mission Directorate during the completion of the space station. Mr. Gersten Meyer holds a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University and a Master of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo. Uh, welcome, Mr. Gersten Meyer. Oh, do I do I in the rest of it? Okay, with the rest of them. Okay, I apologize. I'm going to do the whole introductions and then I'll turn it over to you all. Our second witness today is uh, Mr. Mark Sarangelo, Special Assistant to the NASA Administrator, who is developing plans for deep space exploration. In this role, he will manage the programs to develop the gateway, human-rated lander, and surface systems needed for a lunar program. Previously, Mr. Sarangelo headed uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation Space Systems, a producer of satellites space transportation vehicles, propulsion systems, and space subsystems. Mr. Sarangelo holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Business Administration and a doctorate. Welcome, Mr. Sarangelo. Thank you for being here today. Our third witness is uh, Dr. Patricia Sanders. We're going to go a little bit out of order from where you are. I promise, Dr. Looney, and I'll get back to you. I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, uh, Dr. Patricia Sanders, Chair of the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel and an independent aerospace consultant. Previously, Dr. Sanders served as Executive Director of the Missile Defense Agency. She has also previously held positions in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Air Force Operational Test Center, and the U.S. Space Command. Dr. Sanders is a fellow of a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and has received the three presidential rank awards for executive achievements. Dr. Sanders received her doctorate in mathematics from Wayne State University. Welcome, Dr. Sanders. We're glad you're here. Our fourth witness is Dr. Jonathan Lunancy, didn't forget, uh, director of the Cornell Center for Astrophysics and Planetary Science. Dr. Lunin is the David Baltimore Distinguished Visiting Science Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Dr. Lunin works on the Cassini mission and the James Webb Space Telescope and is a co-investigator on the Juno mission. 
He is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, where he has been involved in numerous advisory and strategic planning committees, including Pathways to Exploration, Rationales and Approaches for a U.S. U.S. Program of Human Space Exploration, where he, which he co-chaired in 2014. Dr. Lunin holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Rochester and a master's and doctorate degree in planetary science from the California Institute of Technology. Welcome, Dr. Lunin. And our fifth and final witness is uh, Mr. Walter Falconer, president of Falconer Consulting Group, which provides strategic planning and business management services. Mr. Falconer is currently a member of the NOAA Science Advisory Board and executive secretary for the Department of Defense Strategic Capabilities Office Advisory Group. He previously held the position of director of business development for space transportation at Lockheed Martin, he also served as a director of strategic planning and development for Space Systems Company. Mr. Falconer holds a bachelor's from Florida Institute of Technology and master's degree from the University of Southern California. Welcome, Mr. Falconer. As our witnesses uh, should know, you each have will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will also be included in the record for the hearing. When you have completed your spoken testimony, we'll begin with, uh, with questions. Each member uh, will have five minutes for questions, and uh, we will start today with Mr. Gerstenmeier. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify on behalf of the NASA team. I think as you saw in the video, this is an amazing time in human spaceflight. We have more hardware and development than at any time in the history of NASA. There are three different capsule designs and work, Starliner, Dragon 2, and Orion. Multiple flight vehicles exist for each of these designs, and the purpose of the designs, either for low Earth orbit or for deep space, are very different. There's also a new winged commercial cargo transport vehicle also in work for the International Space Station. We also have a large heavy lift launch vehicle in work. The first launch vehicle core is scheduled for completion this year for further testing and assembly. The second launch vehicle core is also under construction. Today, you can go see and touch the vehicles that will, that will return crews to the moon and enable research and technology development that will allow us to go to Mars. Further, we have an amazing international research facility in low Earth orbit. We've had crews in space continuously since October 2000, almost 19 years. The International Space Station is allowing commercial industry to experiment with revenue concepts in low Earth orbit, NASA to test the next generation of life support systems, NASA to understand how to keep crews healthy for long durations in deep space, and perform fundamental research in a variety of fields. All of this ISS research ultimately supports improving life here on Earth. With all this activity and work, there's a new excitement in the space workforce. It is very timely and fitting today that we have this hearing titled Keeping Our Sights on Mars, a review of NASA's deep space exploration programs and lunar proposal. Ultimately, all of these hardware development efforts are tied together, and they all support building systems that will allow us to move human presence into the solar system. By taking the long view, we can keep the individual activities linked. We do not have time or funds to build unique, one-of-a-kind systems. We need to build systems that can improve technical knowledge and can be used to support multiple objectives. The challenge of Mars with humans is large and requires all of us with commercial industry, universities, the public, international partners to work together to make this goal a reality. Interoperability standards being developed, such as the International Docking Standard, will allow all to participate in this goal. Recently, we were challenged to return to the surface of the moon with humans in 2024. Having a sense of real urgency is critical. This can help focus our efforts and create a framework for timely decisions keeping the long view, but creating the urgency for near-term objectives can create a strong framework for us to work together. NASA's building off the systems already in work as mentioned earlier. We will select partners to develop the first element of Gateway, the power and propulsion element, by this summer. We will select partners to begin stunning the lunar descent systems, transfer vehicles, and investigate refueling options. We have a synopsis out for review of the human la lunar lander system. All of some of these systems for the moon, such as the ascent vehicle, can be used for Mars. The transfer vehicles and power systems all have applications towards Mars. 
Learning to operate reusable systems at Gateway and navigate around the moon are all helping us to learn how to keep crews safe on journeys towards Mars. The Gateway itself can help us to understand Mars transit vehicle requirements. The moon is a great proving ground, a great place to learn for deep space systems that are necessary for Mars. We are taking the next generation of space engineers and we are training them for the future. The risk and challenges are huge, but so are the gains. The challenges that we face all help to improve life here on Earth. The recycling systems on IS needed for deep space travel have applications here on Earth. We must never think that tests or operations are easy or routine. We will stay vigilant with a sense of urgency. We will look forward to continuing to work with this committee to achieve amazing things in space. This committee has been tremendously supportive in the past and often asked for concrete plans for human exploration. We are ready to finalize those plans and work together with a sense of urgency. Working together, we can accomplish amazing things. I look forward to your questions and the dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Mr. Sarangelo. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's really an amazing time to be able to come here and talk about America's deep space program. It's been 50 years since we first went to the moon and 47 years since we've been back. I believe it's time we take another step. That step will be the first on the renewal that we will have, not only to the moon, but to Mars and beyond. And from NASA's perspective, the next step will be taken by the first American woman on the moon. We will return to the moon this time, not just to visit, but to stay. After building on our success in low Earth orbit, we'll be combining the expertise of NASA along with our commercial partners, our universities, our laboratories, and our international partners to develop the exploration capabilities we'll need and the architecture that will get us back to the lunar surface as safely and quickly as possible. But there's more to that. We will create new jobs. We will create new economic opportunities. We will motivate generations of young people. The science and technology we'll develop along the way will improve our life on Earth. Even though our eyes are on 24, 2024, we're not beginning there. This year, coming up in the next few months, we will start with a small series of commercial robotic uh, missions, precursor missions, we call them, to the moon. We'll use these landers and robots and technology to conduct science across the lunar surface. Throughout my long history in the space industry, I've been fortunate to lead teams that have participated in hundreds of space missions, including missions to multiple planets, asteroid, the sun, and of course, the moon. Whenever I get asked questions, most of the time I get asked, it's about the shiny spaceships or the rockets or the technology. And, and that's a wonderful thing to do. And it's as a technologist, as a builder, it's a, it is wonderful to talk about those. But today I'm here as a futurist and now as a proud new member of the NASA team and as an American, I wanna put the technologies aside and talk a little bit about the why. Why go back to the moon? Why now? Why this expedited effort? Why America? Just as Apollo inspired previous generations, the NASA today is uniquely positioned to continue that inspiration to inspire the future generations. We already work with over 60 universities and have created thousands of internships which have turned, uh, sparked thousands of dreams. But we're not satisfied. There's more that we can do. By bringing the, cap the capabilities of our country together to return to the moon and onto Mars, we'll demonstrate to the young people of this country and around the world the power of dreaming big. We hope to create an unparalleled example of what humankind can do when it comes together to do, do an uncommon task for the common good. These next generations may or may not take the power of this lesson to space or to the space industry, but they will take them somewhere. In my view, the, the biggest legacy of the Apollo program were not the rocks that we brought back, but it was the people that we inspired, generations of those people, some sitting in this room today, that went on to make America a better place. The moon is a treasure chest of science. The lunar samples returned to the Apollo program dramatically changed our view, but it's just the beginning. We believe the South Pole, which is our first destination, holds millions of tons of water ice. That ice represents power, represents fuel, it re represents scientific discoveries. As we go further into space, it's gonna become even more necessary for us to learn how to live in space without the connection to the Earth. We need to learn to do this, and the moon is a good place to make it happen. As was said earlier today, the exploration is in our DNA. The, the ability for humans to want to go to places we haven't been has been around as long as humans have been around. Not only through the oceans, underneath the oceans, across the lands, but now into vast regions of space. It's really part of our psychological makeup. But more importantly, it fuels our soul. You don't have to go any further than just see the faces of the young kids who come to visit NASA or to know that the Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in the world. 
We believe the moon is a test bed, a test bed for learning and a test bed for Mars. It provides opportunities to demonstrate new technologies that are necessary for those missions. But along this path, we're also going to be creating a new revolution, an economic revolution. Generations past had the industrial revolution, the computing revolution, the internet revolution, all of which helped make the U.S. leader in the world. The next revolution, in our view, is going to be happening in space. Finally, as we approach this Memorial Day, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on all those who have given their lives for us. And today, everywhere in the world, they're standing watch for us. If you ask those people who are doing that why they're doing it, most of them will say to protect their families, to protect their homes, to protect their country. And I think one more thing they'd say is to protect the American way of life. As part of that, I believe that American way of life not only has all the things that we live for and exist every day, but it's also an important part to understand that it gives us the chance to dream, to dream big, and to chase those dreams. I know I had this chance, and it brought me to this hearing and gave me a chance to touch the stars. And we want to make that happen for a lot of other young people in the world. Even now, 50 years later, people around the world would point to the Apollo landings as one of the most important things that we've ever done. And we think it is. But we think the way to honor those people who've been part of that Apollo program is to not only look at those grainy videos and pictures, but to create new high-definition views of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sarangelo. Uh, Dr. Sanders. Chairman Horn and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss NASA's Deep Space Exploration Program. A principal role of my panel is advising NASA and the Congress on the safety and risk of human spaceflight. I emphasize that our responsibility is to provide advice driving down risk to the lowest level consistent with accomplishing the mission. Um, space exploration is inherently dangerous. The environment is hostile. The systems needed to survive in it are complex. The aim is not to avoid risk at all costs, but to manage the risk intelligently. Over the, our advice over the years has had consistent themes. One, as um, Representative Bamford has quoted, is the importance of setting challenging but achievable schedules and not allowing undue schedule pressure lead to decisions adversely impacting safety and mission assurance. A second is addressing the question of how safe is safe enough within the context of the overall risk-benefit equation. The third is the importance of constancy of purpose. And fourth, holding to the fundamentals of risk management while recognizing that no single approach dictates the success of, of such a, an approach. I'll speak briefly to each in the context of the current programs. The administration's policy of the, is to return astronauts to the moon within the next five years, adding urgency to a complex and ambitious endeavor. Our panel continues to caution that targeted launch dates, while useful to impart a sense of urgency, should be used judiciously. Unrealistic schedules can result in poor decisions, at least from a safety perspective, if they lead to unwise shortcuts or elimination of critical testing. For example, we know that NASA is exploring options for launching Exploration Mission 1 as early as possible. This can have positive results, perhaps achieve greater decision velocity, restructured and more efficient workflow, a more streamlined approach. But we should not forget that the ultimate purpose of that flight is to mitigate risk and understand operational margins prior to the first crewed flight. Critical data is required to ensure as much as possible a safe EM2 mission, including a successful green run, an effective heat shield, effective operation of parachute systems, abort mechanisms, and environmental control and life support systems, among other things. In addressing safety in human space exploration, balancing the risk with value is important. It's paramount. And as um, Congresswoman Horn has said, NASA's role in advancing space exploration pushes the envelope with great uncertainties and inherent risks. But safe as a term in this context does not have the same connotation as in a typical day-to-day -day life. With no excuse for negligence, it is impossible to control, eliminate, or mitigate every risk. So determining an acceptable level of risk balances many factors to decide if the chance of a mishap is outweighed by the likely mission benefit. Return to the moon should not be an end in of itself, but considered in a risk value framework. We should ask, as she has, um, is the objective, what is the objective of the mission? 
is a part of a cohesive long-term strategy? Will it buy down risk for future exploration? Will it provide infrastructure enabling next steps? Does it further a national goal of commercial space self-sufficiency? Does it support national leadership and foster international cooperation? Great exploration has involved major risk, whether it was Magellan or Lewis and Clark, but it has been undertaken with an expectation of great benefits. Hand in hand with the risk value proposition is constancy of purpose, national steadfastness in pursuing stated goals that does not waver over time and a willingness to support those goals with the necessary resources. Fluctuating policy, ambiguous objectives, budget inadequacy, and uncertainties add complexity and inefficiency to program management. They detract from meeting technical goals and they dilute focus on safety and mission assurance. Lastly, as, Mar as NASA embarks on the next phase of space exploration, I encourage them in partnership with the Congress to sustain the foundational standards of risk management while embracing new approaches. To that end, we can learn from and expand on the positive aspects of the experience with the commercial crew program. We evolved there over time, and the establishment of mutual trust and transparency, the use of badgeless teams, early engagement and appropriate engagement of the government, um, appropriate contract flexibility, and timely decision making. These bring the potential to not only lower costs and shorten development time, but also to reduce risk. Um, in closing, I note that NASA and the nation have made great progress in the last few years, but a lot of work remains ahead. It's a time for excitement, optimism, and reason caution. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Uh, Dr. Lunin. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss NASA's Deep Space Human Exploration Program including proposed lunar activities. In June of 2014, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine released a report entitled Pathways to Exploration, Rationales and Approaches for U.S. Program of Human Space Exploration. I co-chaired that committee together with Mitch Daniels, president of Purdue University. The Pathways report was a response to a charge from Congress in the 2010 authorization bill to review NASA human spaceflight and to determine the value and benefits of the program, if possible. The key findings of our report were the following. First, Mars is the horizon goal for human spaceflight for a number of reasons, but it is also decades away due to the enormous distance and the need for substantial technology development. Second, a program to send humans to Mars ought to be based on a pathways approach, the pathways being different options by which to get there through intermediate stepping stones that provide short-term successes and technologies that can feed forward to an eventual Mars mission. The moon represents, and in particular the surface of the moon, represents one intermediate destination, and although it was not in our purview to choose, we found that it had the highest feed forward to uh, humans on Mars. Third, crucial to such a long-range endeavor are international partnerships in which the space agencies of other nations play significant and meaningful roles. And fourth, key technologies that must be developed for humans on Mars are entry, descent, and landing on Mars, advanced in-space propulsion and power, and radiation safety, among others. So why the moon? The moon offers a number of opportunities and advantages over the direct to Mars approach. First, the moon is less than five days away, greatly simplifying logistics in response to emergency situations. Second, the moon provides a superb opportunity to do important planetary science, particularly regarding planet formation and evolution in the earliest history of the Earth. Third, the moon allows a more permanent rather than a sortie concept of operations over time as surface systems are developed, including continued development of environmental control systems that are more nearly closed and require less provisioning from Earth than does the International Space Station. So what lessons then should the human spaceflight program and its return to the moon take from the Pathways report? Well, first and foremost, we must be in it for the long haul. 
An Apollo-style sprint to the moon in and of itself is not a stepping stone to more distant goals in deep space exploration. And second, the agency has to balance schedule against budget. Schedule-driven programs will cost considerably more per year than budget-driven programs. And the 2024 goal of putting humans on the moon should not be undertaken without resources adequate to that goal, but also without cannibalizing other important programs that NASA is conducting, including its remarkable uh, space science program, which has made groundbreaking discoveries from the cosmos to the planets to the Earth. Third, engage international and commercial partners in the program as they are crucial to a successful program of sending humans to the moon and Mars, but the US civil space program, NASA, must lead the effort. And finally, recognize that if the nation wishes to undertake a program of deep space exploration, it must always bear in mind and never forget that the moon is a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone to Mars. In remarks last month to the University Space Research Association, Scott Pace from the National Space Council talked about sustainability of exploration. One of the points he made was that programmatic sustainability in human exploration requires sustained political support, and in turn, sustained political support requires a good cadence of successes. Taxpayers can see a return on their investment in a short enough time for the relationship between investment and payoff to be clear. And it is precisely that approach which our Pathways Report endorsed and detailed in order to assure that Americans will return in a timely manner to the moon and one day walk on the red soil of Mars. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. DeLunine. Uh, Mr. Falconer. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and members of the subcommittee, I am honored to be here today to discuss and support NASA's Deep Space Exploration Program, first returning the United States to the surface of the moon by 2024 and on to Mars in the 2030s. This year, while we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, China, India, and Israel are sending their craft to the moon. Where is the United States? We are currently facing a formidable challenge from China to surpass our leadership. I, for one, actually welcome this challenge because it helps us to focus and galvanize to maintain our leadership in space. Leveraging over 60 years that has brought us the space shuttle, the International Space Station, and now new craft like SLS and Orion, CST-100, New Shepard, Dream Chaser, Cygnus, Dragon, we have an armada of capabilities to build upon to return to the moon and head on to Mars. I applaud the goal of returning to the surface of the moon by 2024 because it provides needed urgency and focus. It is also very achievable. It took us seven years from President Kennedy's speech in September of 1962, starting with very little, to get to the moon by July of 1969 with Apollo 11. In fact, when President Kennedy gave us the challenge to go to the moon, only three Americans had ever flown in space, Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn. That was it. And this time it will be different when we go back to the moon because it be besides investing in all these different spacecraft over the last 10 years, we'll be going with international partners and a very robust commercial industry. The second core requirement is to go back to the moon in a sustainable way. We are going back to stay. That means we have to address what are we gonna do on the moon after we get back in 2024. As I addressed in the paper I provided you, there are key questions we'll be able to answer on the moon in our endeavor to explore, including science questions. We have discovered many new questions in science pursuits since the Apollo program that include things called lunar swirls, skylights, and the applied science providing ground truth to the resources and minerals that we have seen from orbit. Exploration questions. Do humans have a future in space? Can we live off the land? What adjustments to our plan to Mars do we have to make along the way? Business questions. Is there a sustainable commercial business case on or around the moon? National interest questions. How do we ensure American leadership in space? The third core requirement is keeping our sights on Mars. The National Academy Pathways Study that Dr. Lenin represents had a key recommendation to maintain long-term focus on Mars as the horizon goal for human space exploration. It is correct, but let's face it, we're not ready to go to Mars today because the risk is too high. 
One of the studies going on at JPL, for example, is quantifying the risk and determining how much of the risk can be retired by going to the surface of the moon or identifying what risks are not being retired by anything we're currently planning. That will be important to help us create an extensible exploration architecture, starting with the end goal in mind. When we go back to the moon, we need to learn how to live off the land, live for longer durations on the surface, and deal with the hazards that the astronauts will be facing on Mars. We can achieve all of these goals, but our largest challenge is not the technology, engineering, or ingenuity. Rather, it's overcoming the institutional momentum that slows down the process, keeps the status quo, and protects rice bowls, stifling innovation. We need to organize and streamline for success. When Dr. George Muller came to NASA from Bell Labs to lead us to getting to the moon in 1963, he recognized that NASA, even in its infancy, needed to be reorganized and refocused from top to bottom. He bravely and fearlessly took on the establishment and streamlined program efficiencies borrowing from the successes of the Air Force Minuteman program while strengthening independent systems engineering by bringing on Bellcom to provide the needed enterprise level systems engineering and integration. All of this can be accomplished with courageous leadership. I really look forward to very soon seeing Americans walking on the surface of the moon and soon after walking on Mars. As President Kennedy stated, the goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, a challenge we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone. Thank you very much for the invitation to appear from me, in front of you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Fal Falconer, and thank you to all the witnesses for your opening statements. I know we have a lot to discuss today, and I'll start with questions, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so. The, the chair recognizes herself uh, for uh, five minutes for the, the first round of questions. Where are they? Are they there? Okay. If I can find my questions, that is. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. So, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, Mr. Sarangelo, thank you for being here. I think it was a great reminder that the full committee ranking member um, played that video. There's a lot of really important and inspirational things that uh, that NASA has brought to us that each of you have, have touched on. Uh, so I have a series of questions because we've got to get this right for so many reasons that, that many of you have mentioned. Uh, the NASA administrator committed to providing the committee with an amended budget request very close to April 15th. So it's now May 8th. And what, my question is, what is the reason for the delay? And can you can you commit to providing this committee with a lunar plan and budget amendment on what date? I guess I can start. I think, first of all, we recognize that this is a really serious challenge we have to lay in front of us, and we need a really solid plan. And, yeah. and was discussed by many of the testimonies here, we need to make sure it's all integrated and all put together in a way that really makes sense. So we've been taking the time. We brought Mark on board. He's been working with us. We've been working to develop detailed plans, building off of what we've already done. So we're taking a lot of the equipment that we've already been doing, the teams we've had in place, and we're figuring out how to use those in a new creative way moving forward. So we're busy establishing those plans. We also have to go through the administration, get budget approval, make sure we understand where we are, even look at the out years. Because if, if we work just near term and we think about just the next year and we don't have those future plans all the way through 24, answer some of your questions about how the why fits in and then how this feeds to Mars, we need to put all that together. So we're taking the time to get that right. We're probably several weeks away, maybe a week to two weeks away from being able to give you a, a plan and, and show you what we have moving forward specific. But we can, at, at a high level, we can describe to you today some of the things that we're doing and moving forward and how we build off of the existing programs. Mr. Sarangelo, do you have anything to add to that? Thank you for the question. It, it's a serious question and we take it that way. Uh, this isn't just about moving a date forward. It's about trying to figure out how to do something different and better at the same time. The process that we've gone through is to make sure that the architecture that we need to design makes sense. Uh, one of the, I think, the highest things we have to do for this committee and for Congress is to come back with answers that we can really believe in, that we can speak to. And those are in the works. We have gone through the architectural design. We've gone through the understanding of what it's going to take to make that happen. But it's also more than that. How does NASA change? How does NASA organize? How do we incorporate the commercial and, and other parts of, this, of our industry to enable this? 
uh, I think, as Bill said, we are well in that way of doing it. We also have an obligation to make sure that we work together with the budgeting process. So from our perspective at NASA, we're very close to doing that, and we understand that the delay is frustrating. But this is a, a big challenge, and we want to get it right. So we'll, thank you very much. It is a big challenge, and we absolutely have to get it right, which is why we need detailed plans and proposals. We'll look for that in a couple of weeks. And I think as uh, Ranking Member Babin and uh, Chairwoman Johnson mentioned, there will likely be follow-up within this committee on that issue. So following up on those questions about these plans, because sustainability and long-term planning is, is critical for something that is this challenging and this important, uh, who in the administration will have final approval and sign-off uh, on the plan? And who in the administration will have final sign-off and approval on the budget amendment? From the NASA perspective, the NASA administrator is responsible for the plan and for the delivering of the plan. We are supporting that. Uh, the budget is then provided as an estimate to OMB, and OMB would then provide the, the budget when it's uh, thoroughly completed it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so what exists? And following up uh, further, what, what acquisition approach, uh, when you're looking at this, what acquisition approach is NASA planning to use to procure the elements needed for the 2024 lander? Are you looking at uh, firm fixed price, cost plus? What, what is the approach that you're, you're looking at right now? I think we're looking kind of at a mixture of approaches depending upon the hardware and systems that we put together. We've been uh, using uh, broad agency announcements called BAAs that have been pretty effective. They're typically a contracting instrument that has a fixed price provision in them. I think there's also a role for some cases to have some cost plus activities. But I think you'll see a mixture of acquisition approaches moving forward depending upon the risk level, the speed, and the maturity of the industry. As you see, we, we've talked, uh, Mark talked a little bit about the commercial landed services program that the science mission director is doing. That's a small lander system that will be land small payloads on the moon. We'll get a chance to see how that works in the science mission director where they can take significantly more risk than we can. And depending on how well that works, we can get a chance to judge how ready industry is to go take on the challenges of human class landers. So we'll use these acquisitions to inform other acquisitions moving forward, but it's a variety of acquisition instruments. Thank you. And will the acquisition approach be included as a part of the plan when you submit it? <clears throat> yes, at a top level, and we're actually implementing some of that acquisition approach today as we sit here. Okay. I know I'm a little bit over time. I'm just going to have a couple more, and then we'll turn it over to Ranking Member Babin. Uh, will, so will, will NASA... My, my next question is about authorities, because there have been a few things. Will NASA uh, be seeking any uh, statutory, statutory authorities to achieve this 2024 uh, moon landing level uh, in the overall uh, program? And if so, uh, when, when, will those, when do you plan to provide those to the committee? They would be provided when we provide the overall plan. Okay, I, I mentioned this because I, I want to note that uh, the reason that I, I question this is that uh, the approach uh, is of, of using a reprogramming request rather than going through the authorizing committee uh, to propose major reorganizational changes, especially since NASA still, we, we don't have the plan yet uh, and hasn't been provided to the committee with any specific uh, plan changes uh, or budget amendment to evaluate it and the request to the Appropriations Committee it takes that approach. Um, following up, do you have any, do you have a lunar, uh, and I think this is, we've seen, we've seen, you know where I'm going, uh, questions about this. Do you have a lunar surface space suit that will be ready for the 2024 mission right now? If so, which suit is it? And if not, when do you anticipate that being available? We don't have a suit that's appropriate for the activity for the moon today. We have portions of the suit that are sufficient, but not the entire suit. Again, um, we're going to understand the tasks that we want to do on that first mission in 2024. And then based on that, we're going to probably um, develop a suit to move forward in that direction. In the past, we started suit activities before we did in the Constellation program. That suit uh, cost for that program became very prohibitive. We need to look at a way that we, we understand the requirements and we incrementally move forward and build off of what we've got. So we need to do some work and, and that'll be discussed again and there's a plan is, we'll, there will be a discussion of the plan for a suit acquisition as part of the overall lunar plans moving forward. Thank you very much. I know we'll have many more questions for the rest of you. For now, I'm going to uh, uh, wrap that up and I recognize Ranking Member Babin.
All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess first I want to recognize two interns from Texas A&M University we have uh, out there in the crowd, Josh Mendes back there, and Rachel Gill in the back as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, in 2011, this committee held a, a hearing entitled NASA Human Space Flight Past, Present, and Future, Where Do We Go From Here? Former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin testified, I'd like to quote from several passages from his testimony and seek very brief yes or no answers uh, from our witnesses. And if you would like to elaborate more, please wait until the end. So to start, this is quote, what does a real space program look like and not look like? A real space program sets and meets stable national strategic goals for leadership on the space frontier by developing, evolving, and preserving national capabilities to operate on that frontier. It does not allow that capability to be held hostage to the goodwill of other powers or to the vagaries of a nascent and fragile marketplace. All very briefly, I would like to go down the line, start with you, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Do you agree with this sentiment, yes or no? Yes. I do. Partially, I agree. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, secondly, uh, a real space program may, I'm still quoting, and indeed should offer a stable uh, market to be addressed by commercial providers, but it cannot be dependent upon such providers for strategic capabilities. A real space program recognizes that this nation has interests that rise above the fortunes of individual private contractors, and it protects those interests. The proper role of government is to reward winners, not to pick them, nor to step in as an investor in enterprises which cannot pass the tests that the capital markets impose. Mr. Gerstenmeier, yes or no? Do you agree with that? Yes. Mr. Srangelo? Yes, I do. Yes, sir. Dr. Lenny? I agree with that statement. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. All right, thank you. Going on, a real space program is grounded in physics, not politics. And stepping outward beyond low Earth orbit in the ISS, a human return to the moon is the next logical goal from a host of scientific, engineering, operational, and even commercial perspectives. From there, and with the experience thus gained, we should proceed onward to Mars and should do so in a timely way, else Mars will always be the, definite, the destination in the future. Mr. Gerstenmeier. Yes. Yes, I do. Absolutely. Dr. Sanders. Um, yes, with a caveat. Okay. Well, we'll if we get if I have time after at the end, we'll we'll hear about that. I agree. All right. Thank you. And then finally, uh, these truths are were, excuse me these truths were recognized in the NASA Admin Authorization Act of 2005 and again in 2008, both of which were originated by this committee. The course for this nation's future in space that was laid out in those acts does not need to be changed. It needs to be followed. We must stay that course. If we do so, the right rocket designs will emerge. If we cannot, the rocket design doesn't matter. Concerning the larger perspective of this hearing, I can thus offer no better counsel to this committee than the guidance which it has previously issued. Mr. Gerstenmeier, you agree? Yes. Mr. Srangelo. I do. Dr. Lenine. I do. Dr. Sanders. Yes. Yes. Mr. Falconer. Okay. Now we still have about an hour, uh, one minute and six seconds left. Would any of you like to elaborate further on these? Uh, Dr. Lenine. So first I'd like to know if I passed the pop quiz or not, <laughs> being a professor. Secondly, my one caveat with the first question was that it is crucial that we engage uh, other agencies of other countries in uh, any program going to Mars. The cost of the undertaking uh, is going to be such and the magnitude is going to be such that not engaging with international partners I think would be a mistake. Certainly we should be leading. We need to lead from the front, not from behind. But I just want to make clear that international participation in sending humans on to Mars uh, is crucial. Should, do you think that those international partners should be on that critical path as well? I think that the answer for, for Mars at least, not necessarily for the moon, but for Mars, the answer is yes, in my view. Dr. Sanders. 
um, the statement said that, that uh, space programs should be physics-based and not pol politics-based. And I agree that the solutions, the technical means, are physics and engineering-based, but sometimes the reason why a program is important is has to do with national goals um, beyond the, the technical goals. I, I would agree. I would agree. Thank you very much. And I think my time has expired, so I want to thank you all, witnesses, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Babin. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, full committee chairwoman Johnson for five minutes. Thank you very much. I'm just filled with questions, and I know it's not time to answer all of them, but I am very impressed with all of the research that's going on now with NASA. And I'm very concerned that much of it might be interrupted to afford the new direction. And I need your opinions on that. Could you start and just go down the line? Sure, I think that we need the uh, we need to invest in new research and new technology to achieve the kind of goals for Mars. So we need to to balance the near term urgency with the need to do the investment in the long term research and science and technology development. Does that include um, discontinuing or slowing down substantially the type of research that's going on now uh, at NASA in Maryland? We should not slow down the research that's, that fits our objectives moving forward. It needs to continue in parallel, and we can use some of that research directly in, in what we're doing. I think Space Station is a great example. Um, the uh, OCO experiment, the carbon experiment, is going to station. It'll be installed Thursday night. That was a spare instrument that was available on the ground that was able to go fly from Goddard up to Space Station and it essentially takes advantage of the space station. So the human spacecraft has essentially provided a home for this instrument that's going to give us a new look at carbon generation that we would not be able to see without the tie between human and research. So mm -hmm. I think there's not a necessarily an incompatibility between the two objectives. What is the future of the Orion or the S S SLS? They, they look strong. We've got a lot of work in place. So as I described in my opening remarks, there's a lot of hardware in place, a lot of hard folks working on that hardware. We're in the middle of very heavy integration down at the Kennedy Space Center with Orion. We're in the final construction of the core stage at uh, Michoud Assembly Facility in, uh, in New Orleans, outside New Orleans. It's a very busy time for us, turning kind of dreams, aspirations into real hardware that will take us to the moon and on to Mars. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Bill's comments, but I, I want to take it one step further because I think your question is, is really an important one. It's, as a technologist, one thing to do is to develop the technology. The second part of it is to actually put it into service to make it work. And I think one of the aspects of this program, by accelerating what we actually are doing, is enhancing the science. We're not just doing the technology, doing the science in theory or in prototype, but we're bringing it to a place where we can actually use it, make it better, and bring it back and improve it for the next generation. And that's a really key and critical part of what we're trying to accomplish. I think the other thing which is really important on this plan is that by going and, and getting ourselves in service by 2024, what we actually are doing is then starting operations in 2024 going forward, many years sooner than what we would have done. And it's in that operational phase, it is in that ability to continue to move forward that we really see the strides that are necessary. If you go back and look at any part of our history in aviation, uh, the difference between the airplane when we entered World War II and when we came out of World War II was incredible. The difference in airplane be when we entered World War I and when we came out of World War, World War I is incredible. And I think what we're seeing here is this opportunity over the next five years to enhance that science, to bring it to the next level, and to put it out in the field where it can do some good is really the difference maker because that's what creates the jobs for the future. That's what takes that technology and makes it useful for the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. It's a pleasure to be testifying in front of you again. Um, with respect to um, research having to do with space science, as you mentioned Maryland, uh, there are places that robots can go that humans cannot. Uh, our committee uh, was serious about Mars being uh, the horizon destination for a number of reasons. NASA spacecraft have gone out through the whole solar system, have looked at the universe virtually to the end of the universe, and uh, those kinds of discoveries must continue as we continue to develop this human spaceflight capability. Having said that, 
There are things that robots and humans can do together on the moon and Mars that will open up a whole new dimension of science and exploration if we can implement that kind of dual approach. NASA's portfolio is a lot bigger than just human space exploration and, and deep space exploration. Um, there's a lot of Earth science work that's very important to a lot of our nation. Um, there's very deep space probing sensors that what we'll see with the joint um, James Webb Space Telescope when it gets will we'll water our eyes. And the first A in, aeronaut, in NASA, aeronautics, um, what they're doing with low, low boom technology and uh, other things, that shouldn't, shouldn't go away just in order to make this one happen. So coming from the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland, I, I am very much in, uh, concerned about the science portfolio as well. But I think it's healthy. And if you look at the portfolio, there's a, there's a great raft of missions being planned. And I agree with Mark that I believe that this initiative will actually help us accelerate not only the science missions, but also the technology that will then benefit the science missions. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, the chair now recognizes full committee ranking member Lucas for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Faulkner, the Vice President's challenge to NASA return to the moon by 2024. Your testimony indicates this is the appropriate course for NASA to pursue based on your experience with other programs. Let's talk for just a moment about the greatest challenges to achieving the goal uh, and how we can mitigate those challenges. Well, as I mentioned, the institutional momentum was one issue, but another one I agree with uh, Dr. Sanders about is the consistency of purpose. You know, quite honestly, a lot of us in this industry suffer from professional whiplash because every few years we change what direction we're going and where we're going and how fast we're going. We need that consistency of purpose so that we can stay focused. And, and so I, that's one reason why I welcome it's logical to go back to the moon and get on to going to Mars. Mr. Gerstenmeier and Mr. Sarangelo, speaking of that, uh, President George H.W. Bush's space exploration initiative was challenged by a $400 billion price tag, which Congress at the time rejected. President George W. Bush's vision for space exploration was challenged by a lack of support from OMB, which failed to request sufficient funds to support the plan. We've made considerable progress since those two proposals. NASA's exploration budget now eclipses $10 billion per year. And we're invested in the space launch system, the Orion capsule, and the supporting ground infrastructure. We've already made investments in next generation systems that are necessary for lunar exploration and stepping and a stepping stone to the moon. What, what's NASA doing to implement lessons from those previous initiatives, and specifically, what is NASA doing to ensure that any plan it submits to Congress for review is sufficient, that being a very key phrase, sufficient to achieve the goal, but also focusing only on the necessary investments? Again, I think as we take a look at the, the lunar objective for 2024, again, as I described kind of in my opening testimony, we're taking the hardware we've already built that's already in pieces, and we've figured out how to implement that hardware to go to achieve the lunar goal. In the discussion about the spacesuits, again, we've got to be careful we don't put more than we absolutely need for the suits for the missions to begin with, but they're evolvable and they're sustainable moving forward. So I think we need to take this in steps the way it's been described, where we put pieces in place that we can build and build the next piece moving forward. The ascent vehicle that we'll look at for the lunar activity, that ascent vehicle has direct applications to the Mars ascent vehicle on Mars. So if we look at where our hardware fits and how it moves forward, we don't have dead ends. We don't build hardware that's unique to one application and move forward. And we need to be very cautious about how we build our, our, uh, our uh, contracts, how we acquire our hardware to make sure we get good value for, uh, for ourselves and to continue to, to do the right, or don't, drive the budget to the levels that are not sustainable. Sir, I think one of the things that is really different this time is that we are, you know, when you're investing in technology as the way we have done as a government and as a country, it's an accumulative process. We are a lot smarter, not only because we've learned the lessons of the past, but because we now are exist in an industry that has significant more spaceflight activity, more significant, more technology on orbit, and we have just understood the, the environments that we're working in to a greatly different level. I know in your, in your 
uh, in your district, you have farmers who are working many generations, and in doing that, you learn from generation to generation, and I think we have done the same thing in our, in our area. We are also backed now by commercial industry throughout the United States, which has invested heavily on its own. So it isn't just government that's making that investment. We're making that investment throughout our entire economy. So understand when I make this next comment, in many ways, as my town meeting constituents speak through me to the body, I speak through you to those who make decisions. Your folks are the can-do people. But at OMB, the administration at the top levels, there are so many elements there. So when I make this following comment, bear that in mind. The previous administration submitted budget requests that were required on what I would describe as creative bookkeeping, switching NASA funding from discretionary to mandatory spending, tying it to increases in gasoline taxes. Those proposals were rejected by Congress. I hope that the proposals we'll receive are not uh, funded in a similar fashion to the things done in the previous administration, because that will cut the legs out from under us. Uh, if we don't accomplish this this time, I don't know when we'll have a fourth opportunity in certainly my lifetime. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Congressman Barra for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Horn and Ranking Member um, Babin. You know, I got my colleague from Colorado riled up when I was mentioning the Mars 2033 report um, suggested that we couldn't get to Mars until 2037. And he said he's invested a lot of time and effort into making these bumper stickers. And, <laughs> and you know, he made some really good points, and, and I think I want to touch on a couple. You know, Mr. Falconer, you touched on consistency of purpose. Part of what made us successful in the 60s was congressional support, administration support, and a consistent goal and a consistent timeline. And I, I have no doubt that if we set 2033 as a goal, put the resources and focus on it, we couldn't accomplish that. What I, I worry about is the politics and the politics of going from one administration to the next. You know, you had the Constellation program that said, let's go to the moon, and then Constellation got canceled. and. We we're going to go do asteroid retrieval. Asteroid new administration comes in. We're no longer doing asteroid retrieval. Um, we're not going to go back to the moon. And unless we have that consistency of purpose, we won't get there in, by 2033. So, you know, I'll leave it to the scientists to decide. You know, if going to a return to the moon is the right next step or something different. But for us to do our job and provide the support to not just NASA, and the difference today is, you know, in the Apollo program, NASA was the launch vehicle, they were the lunar lander, they were, you know, the science mission. Well, today's world is much more complicated. You've got commercial um, launch vehicles, you've got much more robust international engagement, you certainly have the, the subcontractors that are out there. And when we think about going to Mars by 2033, we're not thinking about doing this by ourselves. So we really do have to then bring in that, that international community. A couple questions that um, yeah, I haven't been able to, to find answers for, but I think it would make our jobs easier as members of Congress to advocate for that consistency of mission. We always look at programs in Congress as an expense item, and I haven't really been able to get an answer on what was the return on investment of the Apollo mission, the number of jobs created, the number of discoveries, um, inventions, new companies found, what was the, the benefit to not just our economy, but, and, and I don't know, maybe Mr. Um, Gerstenmeier, would you have those numbers, or is there a good place that you could direct those, or should we direct the academies to perhaps do a study so it's not just a cost, but here's that return on investment that we're going to get. Yeah, I think that would be best if I took that question for the record, because there's been numerous studies in the past, and rather than recall those from memory, we could actually pull those, we could provide <laughs> those to you, and then you could determine if they're sufficient or you want to pursue something else. That'd be great, because again, it, it certainly would help us make our case. You know, we're going to spend billions of dollars if, you know, both going to the moon, but then if the goal beyond the moon, you know, another question that, um, you know, in one of the opening comments, there's, you know, China is going to the moon, um, they're not putting a person on the moon, India is going to the moon, et cetera. Our focus is to, to go to the, the polar ice caps, 
And you know, one question, and I've talked to my colleague, he's a lawyer, I'm a doctor. Um, when, they, when we get there or they get there and they start extracting some of that ice, who actually owns that ice? I mean, and, and you know, I, don't, I don't just put that out there because it, you know, what are our property rights? Is it the gold rush? Is it whoever gets there first can claim that? Because in my mind, you know, we're going to think of the moon a little bit as a gas station if we're looking at it in the context of going to Mars. We're going to take that ice, turn it into fuel, and obviously it'll be a lot easier to launch from, from the moon. I don't know if that's too simplistic, but I'd, I'd toss that out there. And, um, Whoever, anyone want to take a, a, a gander at that? Or is that the type of thing that we ought to think about proactively and set the parameters? Will this be like Antarctica, where you know, this is really an international resource for an international project? But I do, because commercial companies are already talking about trying to get there as well. And you know, is that the right question that we should be asking or thinking about, or certainly working? Anyone want to take a crack at it? Uh -huh. I, I think the question is an appropriate question. When we're talking about doing the plans for what we're doing, it's not just a plan for the hardware or the technology. It's a plan to be there, which means all aspects of being there, the human life, the science, the, the research, but also the understanding of how to do it properly. Uh, exploration has been going on for quite a long time in the human race, and there have been these issues before. We've s sorted out those issues on the oceans, for example. There is the maritime law that, that handles it. So I think as we do this, it's beyond our scope today and we can't really answer the question, but I think the question is an appropriate one that we need to consider as part of our longer term plan. Great, and I certainly think that's a question that you know, American space industry ought to think about and we ought to grapple with it and take it to the international community. So thank you, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Congressman Brooks for five minutes. Dr. Sanders, the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel previously cited a number of safety concerns with both Boeing and SpaceX commercial crew vehicles. One item your report cited was parachute-related concerns. Have there been any recent tests of the parachute system conducted? Yes, um, there's actually been a, a large number of tests of the parachute systems conducted. Um, uh, both, both for Orion um, in the longer range program, and both and the SpaceX and Boeing um, commercial crew programs, um, and I think they've made a great deal of progress in understanding those uh, those um, uncertainties involved with that. It's one of the largest risks they have in. This Can world. you tell us about the results of recent tests, say in the last month or two? Um, I think Mr. Gerstermeyer probably could do a better job with that, but, but um, there have been a number of po very positive tests, um, results confirming that what we would expect or would, would desire in terms of reentry um, pr uh, performance of the parachutes. There have been a few less satisfactory results and some tests that are indicating that there may need to be some redesign or some uh, adjustments made to the design that they have ex as now. And that, those are important to get right before you launch humans. More specifically then, did SpaceX conduct in April of 2019 a parachute test in Delamar Dry Lake, Nevada? Yes, I believe. And what, what happened in that test? I, I didn't, cannot answer that right now. Um, Mr. Gerstenmeyer might have better, better data than I have at the moment. Mr. Gerstenmeyer, do you know what the result of that test was? Yeah, the test is going to force us to go back and look at some potential. Um, well, I, we're not sure exactly. The test did not was not satisfactory. We did not get the results we wanted, but we learned some information that's going to affect potentially future parachute designs. The other thing we need to understand was it a test unique circumstance? Was it was it driven by an actual design problem in the hardware, or was it driven by the, the setup of the test or the particular equipment that was used during the test? Can you get more specific when you say it wasn't what we wanted? Yeah, it didn't fail. It failed. It didn't, uh, it didn't, the parachutes did not work as designed. It was a one single out test for this parachute, so typically that test would involve four parachutes. One was pre- uh, proactively failed ahead of time, and then the, the three remaining shoots did not, did not operate properly. 
The good thing on the test was we had instrumented, instrumented lines going up to the parachute, so we know exactly what the loads were in the system, but we still need to understand whether it was a test setup configuration coming out of the aircraft or if there was something associated with the packing of the parachutes, the rigging, all that, but this is part of the learning process. By these failures, we're gonna learn the data and information to affect a design to end up with a safe design for our crews. Mm -hmm. So I don't see this as a negative. This is why we test. This is why we wanna push things. This is why we wanna learn. What, what was the impact on the vehicle of the parachute failures? The, it was a test sled and the test sled was damaged upon uh, impact with the ground. And you're comfortable that corrective measures will be undertaken? There's no question comfortable, or I'm very comfortable. Their teams are fully engaged. We are understanding this. This is a gift to us. We have, we've gotten data that is unique that will help us design, understand if this is something that needs to be fixed or if it's something that was just a nuance of the test and the configuration. And the All right, let me, let me move on engaged. to another one because I've only got 60 seconds left. Um, the the goal, as I understand it from the vice president, is to uh, reach the South Pole of the Moon by 2024. Uh, can any of you tell me what the additional cost will be or appropriations needed by NASA in order to achieve a landing on the South Pole of the Moon by 2024? Uh, not at this time, sir. We, are, we have pr uh, provided preliminary estimates to OMB. OMB is reviewing those along with our CFO, and th that information is, is imminent. What is the... Preliminary estimate. I'm sorry, sir, we can't, uh, it right now is under review and we can't uh, come up with a number. How would it be paid for? Where would the money come from? That's why we're not here today to be able to speak to the money side of the, of the equation because at this point in time, there's, it's still under discussion with OMB and NASA. And do you have a judgment as to when we will know what the requested amount of additional budget will be? Uh, that will come when OMB releases it. We've provided the information. I, I will say there's been significant discussions. Uh, the discussions have been very positive and open, and as soon as those discussions are complete and OMB has approved the numbers, they'll provide it to you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Congresswoman Hill for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. A couple questions. For NASA's deep exploration systems, nearly 4,000 employees in California supplier companies work on SLS, Orion, or the Exploration Ground Systems, which is the largest supplier workforce of all 50 states. These programs are, of course, critical to our National Space Exploration Program, and engineers, technicians, and software programmers in my district help contribute to the space program in our return to the moon and beyond. Uh, the chairwoman already mentioned acquisition. I know you've spoken about it some, but I'd like to learn more about how NASA will utilize existing contracts and supply chain infrastructure in getting to the moon by 2024 and beyond to Mars. In the case of SLS and Orion, we're brand uh, exploration ground systems. Those contracts are, we're completing the design phase and then we're gonna go into production and operations. So we're starting to put out uh, requests for proposals for a sustained uh, cadence of buying those vehicles. And we're looking for ways to buy multiples of the vehicles at one time to get a more effective, uh, effective cost plan for us. And it also allows industry to then plan for a more stable workforce moving forward. Great. Mr. Gerstenmeier and uh, Mr. Sarangelo, I understand that NASA believes there are a small number of basic elements needed for the 2024 lunar landing, a power and propulsion element, a small habitat, and an integrated landing system. Given the rapid timeline in which it would, uh, work would need to occur to meet the 2024 deadline, can you please explain a few things? Uh, what are the dates when each of these elements will be on contract? We've received proposals for the uh, power propulsion element. Those are being evaluated now by the NASA teams and it should be probably by this summer. We should make an award or awards for that activity for the power propulsion element. The, um, the mini habitation piece that will need to be on uh, the gateway, that's still kind of an early acquisition. We're gonna go through acquisition strategy meetings at the agency probably in the next couple of weeks. Then we'll be ready to go out with some kind of activity. For the lander systems, we've done a synopsis already for the descent portion, the transfer vehicle and the refueling piece. We've received proposals for those. We're evaluating those now. Probably again in probably a month or so, we're ready to go uh, make some awards for study phases for that. 
And then we just recently dropped a synopsis out, which looks at the entire integrated landing system from gateway down to the surface and the surface back to gateway. That's, uh, well, after we receive comments to the synopsis, we'll put out an instrument uh, broad agency announcement to go acquire that. And that's probably also within about a month or two. So in probably two months, all the pieces necessary to get to 2024 will be in some serious study phase or will be in serious acquisition for the hardware and systems to move forward. Great. You're in agreement, Mr. Sorry. I am in agreement. Uh, I would also add that what, what Bill has been speaking to represents a substantial utilization of the American industri industrial base to make that happen. And the idea of being able to contract this out and contract this out in this rapid fashion is one of the benefits of being able to move forward quickly, is to make sure that industrial base stays strong and, and stable and that we have access to that for the long term. So that relates to, would either NASA or the contractor be willing to provide Congress with a clear understanding of the details of the contracts? So, you know, who would be responsible for cost growth and development or testing um, the government or the contractor and what's the timeline um, involved in the test program, et cetera, et cetera? We can provide that when, when we get to that phase or when the plan comes out, we can describe that to you. I think the thing that's important is, in the past, NASA had to do all this development on its own in the Apollo era. What's really unique now is industry is very capable of doing some of these things, and, and we need to utilize industry where we can and take expertise from industry and work approaches where we share risk with them, we share acquisition approaches with them. We're doing that in the commercial crew program that we just discussed where there's a shared accountability for, for um, resources and for safety kind of aspects, and we're working those. And we'll build off of what we've learned in the commercial crew program and take that forward as we go to the lunar systems. So I guess the final question then, we're almost six months into 2019 and elements are going to need to be, of course, completed months in advance of the launch to enable integration and uh, with the launch vehicles and preparations. How much real confidence do you have that a human landing on the moon in 2024 is achievable? I think it's very achievable. The challenge will be, can we get through the political process? Can we get the political stability, can we get the funding necessary to go do this in the time frame to move forward? Can we get any legislation for relief that we might need and get a clarity of purpose? Can we get united in this goal enough to move forward at the pace that we'd like to go? That'll be the biggest challenge. The money my colleague was talking about. Thank you all so much. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Hill. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Posey for five minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. It was great to see that uh, NASA has provided recently our roadmap uh, to go on to Mars, but uh, or going back to the moon by 2024. Great step toward getting to Mars. Exciting that that finally happened uh, to achieve, you know, the ambitious timeline. I think that we all agree that we need to ensure that there's number one sufficient funding to get that done. We had a uh, a diagram of missions to nowhere. Uh, I think we had over two dozen different missions, uh, over $20 billion up in smoke because we couldn't stay on one plan from administration and to administration, Congress to new Congress. Uh, <clears throat> both the administration and Congress should continually uh, fund our critical space assets such as uh, SLS, Orion crew, uh, exploration ground systems, mobile launcher two, and the lunar orbital platform, obviously. Uh, Mr. Gersmeyer, can you, without getting too deep in the bushes, just give me a little uh, brief summary of the benefits of an SLS green run? Okay. So I think that the simplest advantage is it allows us to see the integrated system work as an integrated system. The, the uh, engines actually pressurize the tank for the, uh, S, for the space launch system. And that's a very complex mathematical model of how the cryogenic propellants and things interact. And to really wait to see all that is, is in a full up integrated test. You can test individual components, but you can't test it as an integrated system as well as you can for a fairly long duration test uh, of the green run. Okay. I would add to that that what this test essentially is is a full run test of the system. We're going to take humans, Americans, and put them on top of this rocket. We want to see the system work for its full duration burn. And the, the best way to do that is to conduct the full duration burn before we then integrate the rocket and put people on top. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Sarangelo, 
uh, in order to support the 2024 launch date, the SLS, with the exploration upper stage, uh, NASA needs to award a contract for the second mobile launcher at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the administrators mentioned that the contract is likely to be awarded in May, and I wonder if you can provide us with a status update on both the EUS development and the schedule, as, as well as uh, when the contract will be awarded for the second mobile launcher. I, I can help. I, we're, we're ready. We're poised to go ahead and make the award for the mobile launcher as soon as the, uh, the, the uh, teams do the evaluation. So that award is on track, and it, it will be either this month or next month, but it's on track moving forward. And then the expiration upper stage, we slowed things down a little bit. We're running at a slower uh, rate this year for the expiration upper stage. We're, we went from 300 million down to 150 million expenditure this year for the expiration upper stage. That was so we could focus on expiration mission one on the core rocket to make sure that the teams and the equipment and effort are getting ready to go support expiration mission one. I would add to that, sir, that one of the aspects we want to make sure the committee understands is that uh, work has not stopped because we've changed the date. We've continued to push forward on many elements of the program. We continue to look to award, and you'll see several awards coming off in the next uh, next quarter. So as we go forth and try to look at the plan and find ways to accelerate it safely, we are also keeping elements of the program which are not going to be affected moving forward. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Beyer for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you guys very much for being here with us today. Uh, on the, the NASA thing, you talked a number of times about international partners. Um, could you talk more about who those international partners are? Will they be China? Will they be Russia? Um, or, or is this typically France and the UK or what's left of the UK? We have a, a number of international partners who have been working with us on the space station for many years. That includes the European Space Agency, the agencies within Europe, uh, Japanese Space Agency, Canadian Space Agencies, and other around the world. Uh, we expect to continue those relationships and move them forward. But, but not China, d d d despite how prominent they are in, in the Martian. Currently, we're precluded from having those discussions, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was fascinated by the notion that one of the driving forces for thinking about Mars was um, thinking about the long-term sustainability of the human race. Um, and I don't know if any of you would like to specifically address that idea of um, building as much, um, as many alternatives, I guess, into our possible human future and how the, the moon Mars mission builds upon that. So, uh, Congressman, I'll try to address that. Um, in our Pathways report, we talked about the various um, reasons for human spaceflight, both practical and aspirational. And one of them is the aspiration not only to explore, but for humans to become a multi planet species at some point. Um, we recognize, though, the realities of humans living entirely independently on a planet as inhospitable as Mars. And so we put the two planet species rationale as an aspirational one rather than a practical one in the sense that uh, I don't think anybody is uh, at all under the misapprehension that by putting a base on Mars, we would avoid uh, human extinction should some planet-wide catastrophe occur on the Earth. Very quickly, the Mars colony itself would, would also go away. So um, we must take care of our own planet in order to ensure that we can survive as a species. But in living on another planet, in having the aspiration and the goal to do that, I think it will change our perspective as a species and perhaps lead to a future that we might not otherwise be able to imagine. So there, but you do talk about living off the land as, as an aspirational goal also. Yes, we do in the report, that's right. Um, but is this also part of the, the energetic search for exoplanets that resemble Earth? So that search is, of course, going on independently of the human spaceflight program. Um, within 
our, I think within the understanding today of technology and the human condition, the ability to sustain humans beyond Mars is something that doesn't seem practical. And the primary issue is uh, that there's type of radiation, galactic cosmic rays, which are very, very difficult to shield against because they're very high energy, and so they produce secondary particles when they collide with spacecraft and with shields. So um, that's one of the reasons why Mars is the horizon goal. Sending humans to other uh, planetary systems around other stars is something that one can imagine, but the practicalities of it, I think, are beyond us at this, this point in time. That doesn't mean we should not be looking for other Earths, because that, again, if we find them, will change our perspective on what our place really is in the universe. I would imagine the excitement has to be, too, if there, if there are other Earths, is there also then other intelligences? It's, that's one of the great questions, not only of science, but of humankind. Are we alone in the universe, and are there other sentient, self-aware beings that we can ultimately communicate with. Yeah. Dr. Sanders, you talk about um, the overall risk-benefit equation, you know, how safe is safe enough. Who, who determines that equation? <laughs> a lot, anyone who makes a decision on accepting risk. Uh, when you, when NASA, and usually that's done at a fairly high level in, in NASA, in the um, administration, um, depending on how much risk it is and, and, um, and uh, what, what the specific causes are. But it's, um, it's a decision that our panel has, has, um, has advocated and strongly recommended that always be documented, which I always say, you know, what are the alternatives you looked at? What was your rationale for deciding that you're ready to accept that risk and that there isn't another alter a safer alternative? And, the, and what you expect to gain by going forward with that risk? Great, great. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to our five witnesses. I'd like to start out about talking about a hero of mine and probably all of your, yours, a man named Gene Cernan. Gene's the only American to go to the moon twice. They did on Apollo 17, we landed and walked on the moon, our most recent moonwalker, and also Apollo 10, the flight that did everything Apollo 11 did except for land. Gene was here in this very room in 2009 when this committee, in a bipartisan manner, fought to save the last mission to go to the moon. It was called Constellation. We saved the crew caps in that battle, but Gene is very adamant. The best reason to go to the moon is because that's the best place in the universe to train for going to Mars. He pointed out a few things. First of all, the gravity. The moon is about one-sixth of our gravity. Mars is one-third of our gravity. To train up there, it's a much better training than in a pool outside the Johnson Space Center. It's real training. In fact, the first steps on the moon were steps. They started hopping. They realized, I can hop quicker and get, go places quicker by hopping instead of walking. He also pointed out that we found out long after we left the moon, there's water on the moon. He said, we don't know what we don't know about the moon. And sounds like all of our panelists agreed that the moon is a good starting point to go to Mars. In fact, I think the quote from you, uh, Ms. Dr. Looney, was, the moon is a stepping stone for Mars. And Brother Gerstmeyer, you said it's a proving ground for Mars. So could all of you go into detail about the benefits of us going to the moon to get us to Mars as quick as possible. How was the moon tied directly for us going to Mars? Gerst, you up first. I think, first of all, that 
the moon is a gr in a proving ground sense is a great place for us to check out the technology to to go uh, beyond the earth moon system it, to build the rockets that need to go there they can have application moving forward we can test them and check them out it's also good from a risk standpoint today we're very comfortable in low earth orbit where if something goes wrong on station we can be back in an hour or so hour and a half when we go out to the moon we're now five days away that's a challenge, but it's not months away like it is when you go to Mars. So learning how to operate, build the procedures in, build the stuff that the control center folks do in Houston, and understand how to operate around the moon will be absolutely critical to build those skills, to build the technology and prove it before it absolutely positively has to work as we go towards Mars. And, and I think it's, a, it's very strong in that sense. Mr. Translow, sir. Thank you, Gerst. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would add to that that one of the best things that one needs to do in order to get good at something is to practice and to practice consistently. Being able to be five days away, being able to make the missions that we're doing and to be able to do them in a frequency that we can actually learn, develop, reiterate, improve what we're doing and do it again uh, allows us to get much better much sooner. So being able to go to the moon and doing all the things that we've been talking about for the last two hours is, is very good. Being able to do it on a frequency that we can actually take the things back and do it better uh, it really makes it a, a much more a feasible and practical path. And what it does is actually gets us to Mars sooner rather than later. Thank you. Dr. Lunini. Sorry yeah, about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Uh, so a number of technologies as... Um, uh, Mr. Gersten Meyer mentioned uh, radiation safety. If we spend a long time on the surface of the moon, we're going to have to deal with shielding uh, that will also be uh, critical for transits to Mars. Um, the environmental control and life support systems for uh, long-term stays on the moon uh, will also be applicable directly to Mars. We talked about habitats as well. We talked about crew health and aspects of in-situ resource utilization, even though on Mars it would be primarily for the atmosphere, there are aspects of it we would use, uh, we would test on the moon. Now let me also say that it's successfully using the moon as a stepping stone, bringing humans back there, working and exploring on the moon, provides a success that the public will see and recognize as a critical moment that will then project us onto Mars. And we made that point in the report but let me say personally, as a 12-year-old watching, a uh, 13-year-old watching Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt in the last Apollo mission exploring the moon for three days, I felt inside of myself that we were going on to Mars and that I would be a part of that. And even though we're here almost 50 years later and we're not on that journey, going back to the moon, working on the moon will create that same sense that yes, we can do that for Mars that I felt back in 1972. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, Dr. Sanders and Mr. Faulkner, I'm out of time, but one comment about Dr. Lanuti's comments. Um, there's a big radiation belt between Earth and Mars. It's called the Van Allen radiation belt. No human being has ever gone through that intense radiation. So it sounds like Mars has something like what we've experienced in the space station and radiation that we don't, we kind of take for granted because we've been so short in terms of our time on the moon or in the space station compared to a trip right now to Mars with our current propulsion systems. Thank you, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Go Navy, beat Army. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Perlmutter for five minutes. Thanks, and um, thank you to the panel for being here today. And Dr. Lenine, I wanna start with uh, your last comments about thinking that we would be moving on to Mars at some point after we had um, traveled to the moon. And that's really been my driving motivation here is, okay, it's about time. It's about time we move on and we get, and, and I've been agnostic as to whether we go straight to Mars, or we go to the moon as a way station, but ultimately to get to Mars. And Mr. Gerstenmeyer's heard me say this a dozen times or more now, which is, and, and we heard from some NASA experts that 2033 was a feasible time frame when the orbits, so the orbital mechanics, it's not just schedule driven, but it's actually driven by, you know, the orbits of these two planets, that that's a shorter travel, you know, shorter uh, journey than before. So, 
uh, as I listen to you all, I mean, there's the rocket science and how we deal with the, the potential uh, radiation issues and, and, and our astronauts' health. And I'm convinced that we have the ability and the technology and the scientists who can work on that, the doctors. The, so we need from you, if, if I were to get the money, okay, and I've said this before, it's a chicken and egg, if you were assured that we had, you had unlimited funds to get to Mars by 2033, Dr. Lenin, could we do it? We heard from NASA earlier, like two years ago, that we could do it. So uh, I would not have two point five percent, not a cadence of four four, no, but maybe two I four or two two. So I don't, you know, in all honesty, Congressman, I don't know what infinite resources actually mean. Um, I will. Okay, say let's. I'll give you an example. Do you know how much we came up for the banks over a weekend? No, I don't. Eight hundred billion dollars. Eight hundred billion dollars. So okay, now I'll, they paid it back. Yes, that's right. With fifteen percent interest. Right. So let me answer the question and then maybe yield to my colleagues at NASA if you wish. Um, so in our report, we estimated the cost of getting humans to Mars as being essentially in that range. Now, in the schedule-driven version of our uh, study, uh, where you were driven by a schedule. Um, we found that you could get to Mars uh, in the mid-2030s, but bear in mind that report was written in 2014, so that's already five years ago. Um, our estimates based on uh, the design reference missions and so on required that the uh, human spaceflight part of the NASA budget grow each year by about four times the inflation rate through 2030 in order to make that happen. But again, that was 2014. And I think I'd like to, if you wish, uh, yield to my NASA colleagues now. Certainly. And I do want to welcome the two Coloradans to the, to the panel, Mr. Sarangelo, Mr. Falconer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I can't answer the 2033 question, as you asked. But what I can answer is to say that this expediting the, the plan to the moon, expediting our knowledge of how to move in space, how to live in space, how to work in space, how to build the systems that allow us to do these things is only going to have a positive effect on our ability to get to Mars. So I think the two are linked. So let me, let's talk about the politics of this for a second. And I, and Dr. Sanders, I appreciate you talking about you can't have too aggressive a schedule because the potential risk is a problem. But on the other hand, if we don't have a schedule, then you got a problem up here. Okay, this isn't so much the, the engineering feats that you all will have to accomplish. There has to be a financing sort of goal here. Otherwise, you'll never see it. So it is a chicken and egg. We got to have something that says, we can do this by this date if you give us this kind of money. And that's what I need. And Mr. Gerstenmeier's hurt. He, he spends about two weeks every month here testifying before this committee. So he's heard this before. And it may be completely a Pollyannish vision that I have. But I have, Dr. Lenin, that drive that you talked about from being a kid who wants to see us get to Mars, with the moon being maybe the stepping stone, but the goal being Mars. And I'm saying that to my friend, Mr. Sarangelo, too. With that, I'd, I'd yield back to the chair. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, and thank you, thank you for your clear intention. <laughs> I think we always know we're going to see a, a, a one of the bumper stickers every time. The chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you so much for coming uh, coming today, and and I. I'm really thrilled to be on, on this committee. My district uh, runs just north of Cape Canaveral with Embry-Riddle University, uh, front and center there, the world's leading aeronautical university. And the chairwoman and I are, I think, one of the only, a handful of members that are on both armed services and uh, the space committee. So we're seeing both sides of what I'm, you know, we're calling the 21st century space race. Uh, the acting secretary of defense likes to use the term new space to describe the expanding role of the commercial space industry in developing 
defense space technology and, and, and also commercial space technology. Can you discuss the critical importance of commercial space to NASA, NASA's deep space uh, missions, the lessons you're learning um, as they, as, uh, from their launches from Cape Canaveral, we're expecting launches every week uh, by 2021. And then, you know, as you're in phase, uh, I guess, phase alpha, or phase A of your planning for the moon landing, how are you engaging commercial space in the private sector in your planning sessions? And I'll, we'll start with Mr. Gerstenmeier. Again, I think we're at a very unique time where commercial space can really contribute in a major way to what we're doing. And, and I think that's really important. And I don't consider it new space and old space. I consider it space. We learn a lot from the, the new participants in the space program. They don't have some of the concerns and some of the, the slowness that we have. We can learn how to move fast again, but then we also have some experience and some, some things that actually help them too. So this working together actually makes us much stronger working together and moving forward. We're very actively engaged with them. We're asking them for ideas on how to move forward. Where NASA would have probably done the total design before, we're now actually involving them in the design process so we can get their good ideas to see what they've learned, to see how we can keep manufacturing low and how we can meet the timeframes moving forward. So I see this as a tremendously positive time. I think we might be a unique opportunity where we can really team together, work together as a team and achieve these aggressive goals towards 24 and on tomorrow. So there being those companies, the various companies, which we probably don't need to go through, but they're being actively engaged now uh, for the, so that the budget and the plan that will come to the committee in the next, I hope, in the next few weeks, will have commercial private sector participation and built into those, those planning procedures. Yes, sir. And I'll go a step further. As, as Bill mentioned, the teaming, you see, you're seeing the teaming here evidence in front of you, sir. I, I've spent my career in the commercial space industry, was one of the founders of the Commercial Space Flight Federation and chaired it for several years. So the idea of NASA creating the team not only outside but inside is a very useful thing for what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, one of the reasons for the delay in, in the planning process here is that we did reach out to industry and have had dozens of meetings uh, at the Space Symposium and since then with industry throughout the United States, throughout the different types of companies in the industry to make sure we did hear these voices, make sure we did understand what would, how they could be part of this. And I think the plan you will see will show a balance of using traditional space NASA centers, NASA space, along with a very significant contribution from the commercial industry. Thank you. Uh, earlier this year, the Defense Intelligence Agency released a report about Russia and China's activities in space. And long story short, Russia and China both explicitly intend to eclipse the United States uh, uh, in space. And they are both developing rockets comparable to the SLS. How do you, from your perspective, why is it important that the U.S. have the most powerful rocket for both exploration and national security? And what do you make of uh, the Chinese landing on the backside of the moon, but then also the recently announced um, research station? Again, I think having a heavy lift launch capability is critical to us to be able to to get large masses to the vicinity of the moon. That's really important, and I think. This is where this uh, commercial and government approach works well together. The SLS can launch as a backbone and carry it. The pieces that have to be launched as one combined package in, in one shot. Then you can use the commercial industry to launch multiple other small pieces to aggregate around the moon. So I think that's critical to us keeping forward and being a leader in space to continue to push those things that don't yet have a, a, a real opportunity yet for big revenue. That's the appropriate role for government. Mark, anything? Uh, I, I, I agree with that, but I would t I also take one step forward. You know from your time being a Green Beret that sometimes you need to stand up and, and take a stand. And I think in this instance what we're doing is saying that we're not going to let that happen. It is part of America's uh, in DNA as we talk about it to be part of the leadership of this industry. And I think what we are doing here and the, the whole aspect of our plan is to be able to step up and ensure that we keep ourselves at the forefront of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. Uh, and thank you uh, to all the witnesses. Uh, but before, uh, before we adjourn, uh, the, the chair and ranking member have uh, a few additional questions, uh, if you'll indulge us. 
for a few more moments. Uh, so I think I think we've raised some really important issues, and that was the the, the critical component of having this having this uh, hearing today, even without the the full plan. So um, directing these first couple questions for Mr. Sarangelo and Mr. Gerstenmeier. Uh, so you have said that that NASA has has come up with preliminary cost estimates uh, for for the 2024 for the moving up the 2024 program. Uh, but right now that those cost estimates are under review by um, NASA, CFO, and then OMB. So we've got some more steps to go. Uh, so I can understand, um, of course, having the CFO review it, but um, I, I'm curious about what role, what OMB's review will entail. Uh, do they have in-house expertise in engineering or program management uh, and, and uh, program management that's going to be really sufficient enough to uh, credibly modify NASA's cost ex estimates because you're clearly the ones with the expertise on what it's going to take to, to do this and what it will take to carry out your mission. So what what is OMB's role in this and what resources do they have? Uh, OMB's role is is a statutory role, ma'am. And from our perspective, it's a, it, we have to go through this. It's not just a technical plan that has to be done in order for this to be communicated and, and brought to the committee in the proper manner. We have to have an entire plan put together. That includes not only the funding, but how do we get it, where does it come from, and how does it fit into the administration's view? Yeah, I, I appreciate that and, and, and know that role. I think the basic concern here, um, as, as it's pretty clear that regardless of party, we are supportive of NASA. We want to see this succeed, but we've seen in the past what happens uh, when when we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle together. And I, so I think the basic concern um, is whether NASA is going to be allowed to ask for the budget it needs, that, that going back to uh, Mr. Lucas' point about sufficient funding, uh, the budget it needs to do these lunar missions, or is it going to be a lesser amount uh, because that OMB would find acceptable? Uh, because you know OMB doesn't have accountability if they, these things succeed or fail. They they have a different role, uh, but we know if it fails, uh, the blame is going to fall to NASA, and that goes back to the need for the plan and the sufficient budget. So, so if the mission fails, we it's it's NASA that's going to shoulder that burden, and I think all of us that lose in the end for so many reasons that we've discussed. And so, Dr. Sanders, I want to turn to you for a moment and and ask you to talk for a moment about any risks related to um, a hard goal that is insufficiently funding, uh, in, insufficiently funded. It's a huge risk um, be, because it puts NASA in the, the, um, the position of having to try to achieve something that's not really achievable. And NASA is full of people who are can-do people. I mean, they're, they're enthusiastic, they're, they're technically capable, they will work their hearts out to try and, ma and make it work. And, but then it's easy, easy, it's possible then to start to rationalize that, okay, well, we can take this shortcut because it's important, we're gonna get there, we'll, we'll do it, we're gonna, we'll, we'll make it work whether it's um, actually feasible, feasible to do it. So I think there's a huge risk if you don't get the adequate resources to go with the schedule. You know, it's always a three-leg stool. You have the cost schedule performance. Um, you fix two of them, the other one, that's, that's where it goes. Thank you very much. And, and I think that, that goes to the underlying need to see a more detailed plan so that we can ensure that next steps and there's sufficient funding because I think many points we have to balance risk, what, what is the right risk and, and ensure that schedule pressure doesn't overcome that and that there's sufficient funding to do what NASA is being asked to do. And with that, I will yield to Ranking Member Babin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple more questions here. Um, I wanted to ask about the ISS, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Uh, it's one of our nation's greatest technological international achievements. Currently, the U.S. and its partners are planning to operate it through 2024. According to the National Research Council's Pathways Report from 2014, 
If NASA maintains a presence on the ISS past 2024 without significant increases to NASA's overall budget, it will lack the resources to fund the development of systems that will push human presence beyond low Earth orbit until late in the next decade. Now, this would leave the Orion vehicle without a clearly defined mission, yet abandoning the ISS could mean ceding global leadership in low Earth orbit to other nations and our competitors. How do we solve this, uh, this dilemma? If additional funding is the answer, where do you propose that we get this additional funding? Mr. Gerstenmaier. I think our proposal is to do both, to continue to use the ISS because it's a critical test bed to test the technology that's going to be needed going forward. For example, the uh, carbon dioxide scrubbing system that's going to be flown on the Orion capsule, it's actually been tested on board the International Space Station. So there's a synergy between space station and the exploration. I think a lot of times we see this as an either or trade. I really see it as an and. We need to go look at the needs for station and the budget required for station. We can gain some efficiencies, potentially in ops and maintenance a little bit, reduce some of those costs. But I think ultimately we need to be in low Earth orbit at the same time we're moving out to deep space to test technologies. Space station is a good test bed to do that. We need to utilize station as long as it's viable from a technical standpoint. And it's, it's a piece of exploration. It is truly the first step in exploration. We're going to have a couple crew members go almost a year in space. That's going to give us tremendous insight into the health mitigations that are required for crews when they go to Mars and other destinations. Station is paying real benefits today for exploration that if you remove space station, you actually cripple space station. You slow down our goals to get to the moon. You slow down our activities to move to Mars. Uh, onto Mars. So we need to use station today in an effective manner. We need to figure out a way to fund both. It will not be easy for you or for us to find that funding. We'll figure out a way to do it. Okay. It's necessary <clears throat> for us in the future. Right, thank you. Uh, then another one to you as well. Uh, will NASA develop spacesuits for service operations and update NASA's aging extravehicular uh, mobility units? EMUs were designed over 40 years ago. They were designed to fit astronauts and made up the astronaut corps at that time. Since then, the astronaut corps has diversified, requiring a broader range of sizes. If we are to extend ISS, what are your plans for EMUs? Yeah, we're working on both. We're, the answer basically is yes to both. We're working on a new spacesuit for the space station. It was, the goal was to demonstrate, I think, in 24. Um, and that suit, the life support system on the back part of the suit that provides oxygen and CO2 scrubbing for the crew members, also humidity control and temperature control, that's common between an on-orbit spacesuit and it's common to potentially a spacesuit used on the surface of the moon. So there's applications there. But our intent is to develop the suits necessary for both cases. And the Johnson Space Center in-house team is working on that spacesuit development today. They've actually been in the NBL doing some activities okay. with that suit. All right, great. Thank you. And last... Um, the European service module is currently manifested through Exploration Mission 2. After that, should NASA plan on using a European service module, or should it seek other more capable alternatives that may facilitate a broader architecture? Mr. Gerstenmaier. Again, I think there's real advantages of, to us working with our partners in space, and we can selectively choose where we put those partners in a critical path. We have put the European Space Agency in a critical path for the Orion uh, service module. That's a propellant system that man maneuvers Orion around in space. They've delivered on their promises. They were a little late with the first module. They're right. doing well on the second module, and they're actually starting to procure and acquire hardware for the third uh, third service module. So, okay. but I, again, I think if, if they continue to deliver, they're a strong partner. They can work with us. They help our achieve our goals in a more effective manner and build the, the international strength that makes these future activities possible. Anybody else like to add to that? Nope. Nobody wants to chomp on that one. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Babin. And, and thank. I wanna once again thank all the witnesses uh, for being here uh, before we close. It, it, this is, these are critical conversations that we need to have and, and information that we need to obtain. And um, I, think, uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, Mr. Gerstenmaier will probably see you here again, and many of you, um, but so hopefully you like seeing our faces. Um, so, so thank you all for being here and uh, want, need to say that the record will remain open for two weeks for any uh, members who wish to add statements to the record or additional questions and uh, the questions taken for the record. Uh, we'll look forward to getting those uh, from you. Um, and the witnesses are now excused and we're adjourned.